The Euro-NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training Program, located at Shepard Air Force Base in Wichita Falls, Texas, is unique in that it is the only internationally manned military flight school in the world. Experience NJEP documents the program through the eyes of its students. At the very beginning of training, we take brand new students and teach them that coalition operations are not only expected, but are inherent in what we do uh, in warfare. Kosovo, Afghanistan, Libya. Coalitions are how we fight today, and that makes the unique nature of NJEP more important than ever. We take students from each of these countries and match them to instructors from different countries where we all use English as the common language and we learn how to work together. And we have a common understanding of military uh, operations. The 25 students in class 1407 who come from the United States, Italy, Denmark, and the Netherlands will face a variety of professional and personal challenges during the 55 weeks of rigorous training needed to learn to fly the T-6 Texan II and the T-38C Talon. For the students of class 1407, their interest in an aviation career is as varied as the countries they come from. My name is uh, Julia. I'm second lieutenant. Um, I come from Italy. Uh, my town is uh, Perugia in the center of Italy. I lived near a, a um, hospital and was very and very often many helicopters landed near my house so I, I get interested in in the world of airplanes and aeronautics. So. Uh, my name is Lieutenant Wade Tolliver Jr. I'm from Kissimmee, Florida. Went to the University of Florida, so go Gators. I grew up a military brat. My uh, dad's a pilot, so I kind of just follow in my dad's footsteps. And uh, I love the military life. I got to move around as a little kid. Lived in a bunch of different countries. I think I moved around about 14 times. I fell on uh, flying because of the individuality, the, the impact one person can have on the battlefield, as well as just you know, how the fact that you're flying. The first part of training involves aerospace physiology basic flight academics, and simulator time to get comfortable in the aircraft. As students get into the routine of inject, the possibility of failure seems to be their biggest fear. Because um, the feeling is amazing at that moment that they decided to pick you to that training. But um, you always know that there can be some things happening in the, in the training that will get in the, on the way to get a fighter pilot. We talk a lot about uh, not letting ourselves down. I guess that's mine, my main motivation. I don't want to let myself down. Um, I've worked a lot to get here, and I really want to succeed. No one likes to fail, so, and, and here in an environment like this where it's very stressful and long hours, it's, it's almost inevitable. You're, you're going to fail at something. You know, no one's perfect, but uh, also use that as motivation, so. To be better going to bed than you were when you woke up that morning. Like that cliche, too. Yeah. <laughs> When they first get here, they're always nervous no matter how calm they seem. And so now we, we're at a point now where we can see the beginnings of their personalities, their natural, uh, their natural selves coming out. The Euroneo Joint Jet Pilot Training Program was established at the 80th in 1981, which really constitutes a direct link to the German Air Force training that preceded it. Since that international culture of interoperability already existed here for so long, INJEPT really was just a natural transition. One of the major objectives of INJEPT is strengthening relationships inside the NATO alliance. When you train 55 intense weeks together uh, and uh, you have your highs, you have your lows and you have to live through that, you understand uh, how not only your national friend uh, sitting next to you, but uh, other nations, how they uh, basically deal with that. NATO is oftentimes going to be that organization that brings us together, and so now we can start early developing the relationships and setting that foundation that facilitates working together later on. 
for the pilot trainees in class 1407, the combined operational exposure at INJEPT begins the process of building relationships. Right now they're just learning to work with each other in a student level, um, learning and uh, growing together in, their, uh, in the initial phases of their pilot training career and their aviation careers. But later on they're going to be going to war together and so the relationships they build here, the abilities to work together with uh, different NATO countries are going to pay uh, huge dividends later on when they're going to war together. We're with four countries. We're with Americans, Italians, Dutchies and the Danes. And it's, it's a good thing because um, we're going to see each other again at, at international exercises and we'll go to combat together. So I think it's really cool that we also train together. All of our operations and the way we operate is based on NATO operations, so what we train here. And in that sense it's nice to go over here and be together with all the other NATO, NATO countries, train this to the same standards. From senior leaders down to the student pilots, learning partnership at INJEPT eases the transition into real-world NATO air operations. After my first instructor tour at Shepard, uh, I was stationed in the headquarters Air North in Ramstein. The same was uh, with the Bosnia crisis, I was in the Vicenza KO. And with the same people who worked with either in Ramstein or at Shepard. Uh, and when you know somebody, it, it makes work easier and communication goes much faster and more efficient. I have been to uh, Lithuania for NATO air policy mission in 2006 and also I flew in uh, Unified Protectors uh, for Libya in 2011. We all know NGEP uh, starts with the partnership. We start trusting each other and once coalition force is needed, then we again come together, uh, do our best uh, throughout uh, our mission. I knew that there were going to be a lot of international guys here. But I didn't really understand what that was gonna, what that was gonna mean for us, and and the the possible ramifications later on down the road in our careers, you know. And I still don't right now because we're 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 still at the very beginning of this. Being part of the INJEP that just it, it increases your exposure to how global every threat is, and truly how much having an ally in in a, a war situation uh, is important. Each country participating in INJEPT contributes to the cost of running the school. Now there's two ways to think of, of the shared cost. There's shared cost in financial resources. There's uh, shared cost in personnel. So what we do for uh, the funding of the program is each country pays a portion that's uh, commensurate with the number of students that, they, that we push through to the maintenance of the aircraft, the fuel, and things directly related to the flying program. Personnel-wise, we have a different formula that we use so that each nation is providing instructor pilots to the program that represents their share of the students that they're putting through. And everybody's joining this uh, program, and they know that the quality is high. And then, uh, sometimes I use a metaphor to say, if you like a cheap hotel, hey, you're going to save some money for sure. This is a five-star hotel. Actually, you're saving money for your future. We will not see single nation involvements, at least from the NATO side. There will be always coalitions going and, and uh, standing together and uh, working on behalf of the United Nations, on behalf of NATO, uh, to get things done. So, the basis for those operations, the understanding, the, the capability to grow together and work together and be successful together, that starts right here. Before Class 1407 can soar above the Texoma skies in the T-6, they have to hit the books first. What they gain in the academic phase of training uh, really will set the stage for the rest of it because once they start flying and when they hit the, the flight line, they're going to be so task saturated and so busy that they can never go back and catch up on that very effectively. It is a little under a week long going through Aerophys. Um, you learn about physiological factors, uh, the aircraft systems that keep you alive, and one of those is, is the uh, ejection seat and the parachute. So they take you out, uh, have a whole facility set up where you uh, practice your parachute landing fall. Um, you slide down some wires, drop, and you can practice a little bit more, and then they uh, also practice dragging you on the dirt so that you can uh, unclip your harness while you're being uh, dragged by the parachute. 
the uh, T6 phase uh, in number of hours, flying hours, uh, we get to about 104 hours on the T6. Why is that? Because we have um, very good uh, simulators these days. We got uh, the UTDs, that's actually only a kind of a mock-up. We got the IFT, that's the instrument flight uh, trainer. And we got the, the uh, OFT, that's the, uh, the, the ball we call it. That's, it has a 270 or th almost 300 degree uh, visual. Okay, we're now uh, one week in the academics. And we got uh, explanations about all the systems of the T6. Uh, we, uh, we just finished uh, the last lesson. The last lesson was a simulated demo of all the stuff that's going on in the airplane during the flights, about all the enunciators that uh, tell you what's going on with the airplane, uh, so that the book uh, does make more sense. It was, it was awesome. I mean, you get in there and it's fun to actually flip a switch and see the lights happen. I mean, we have posters at home where we can sit and look at it and push it, but nothing happens. But to get into an actual simulator where we flip a button and stuff happens, it's just one step closer to the actual plane. With the academic phase of training complete, the students finally get their first taste of the flight line. Typically on day one, when we start doing dollar rides, so their first ride in the, their first flight in the T6, they're usually pretty excited and usually pretty relaxed. A little bit nervous because they've never been in the aircraft before, but the expectations are so low that as long as they can start the, the engine and uh, get us taxied out there, then that's pretty much all we're looking for. Just excited. We've been sitting in the classroom for the past three, four weeks, just ready to finally get in the aircraft to know what it feels like. When I was walking out to the aircraft, I was, I was pretty nervous. Uh, I've only been out to the aircraft once before then, and I knew I had to do all the outside exterior checks. After just a few weeks in the T6, the students are put to the test making their first solo flights. It's very compressed as far as all the information they need to learn about the pattern, about the priorities, um, emergency procedures, all that stuff. That's why the, the very beginning of, of phase two is we're very crunched for time trying to ensure that they learn all this stuff so that they can, can go up and have a safe solo. So, How nervous are you? Uh, gotta use the bathroom nervous. We shut the engine off and my peer was trying to give me some advices how to face the different situation. Yes, the last tip that a great IP can give you. Because we don't have wings, but we are going solo. So a pilot without wings. So you need some wings, and he was giving me the, his wings. I was a pilot in that moment. Another long-standing tradition is after the initial solo, being thrown in the dunk tank. After over 100 hours of flight time in the T-6 learning the basics of military aviation, it's time for Class 1407 to move on to Phase 3, the T-38. As they transition into the T-38, it doesn't take Class 1407 long to figure out that the journey to becoming NATO Air Warriors just speeded up. The transition for them uh... The obstacles they have to overcome, I think, uh, are the uh, basically getting used to high speed and the different kind of uh, airframe that they're flying. Uh, the T6 is a 
It's a thick wing aircraft, and the T-38 is very thin wind and high speeds, so uh, the difference they're going to have to adjust to is A, the speed and, the, and the, the, the little amount of fuel that actually is available, so time, efficiency, and... T-6 was stressful because we were learning how to fly, and that was, you know, that was half the battle that, that, with that aircraft, like coming to 38, basically know how to fly, you know, basic uh, aircraft control, stuff like that. I think the aircraft is a lot easier to fly. Uh, it was a definite transition of mindset from learning how to be a pilot and fly airplanes to learning how to fly an airplane, um, specifically a fighter type aircraft. So the mindset was really the big change. Seeing from the uh, T-6 to the T-38 is definitely is a huge shock. Um, you, you know, you go from doing two-ship tactical low level in the T-6 and you're feeling pretty good about yourself, and then you go into the T-38 and your first takeoff at full AB is it's pretty eye-opening. Uh, the, the pace at which everything happens is, is so much faster. I mean, the biggest difference is it's fast. Um, that's kind of like the first kick in the pants is in the T-6 you could kind of fall behind a little bit and the uh, IP could kind of coax you along the way for you to catch up and find out what mistakes you're flying, you know, doing while you're flying. T-38, you fall behind right away. There's, there's no catching up. It's, you need to be ahead of the jet, thinking ahead what you're going to do next. And so that was the big eye-opener. Uh, and when transitioning to 38, so everything moves twice as fast. After making the initial adjustments to flying the T-38, the students once again find themselves soloing. As a class, as a whole, uh, they're progressing. Uh, we've had one solo so far, uh, and uh, although things could have gone better on that one, uh, he did the right procedures uh, to uh, correct the, the, the deviations that he had. They're, they're coming along nicely. They're showing a good learning curve, um, making it happen. I was really excited, really nervous. I wasn't scared um, until I took off and I realized I had one of the aircraft with the new tension springs installed in the uh, stick. So I thought I had a flight control malfunction initially, uh, which was a little scary. But it was uh, one of the best feelings I've ever had, getting out to the area, flying by myself, and bringing the jet back safe. When you solo the T-38, that's the biggest thing that I've done in pilot training, right? Because there is, it is a jet that you have to really respect. And if you don't respect it, you know, you can, you can kill yourself very easily. And uh, to, to land and have successfully accomplished a mission, whether it's with an IP or especially solo, is, is a great feeling. For some of the students, the road to becoming a military pilot is not being traveled alone on the home front. So having my wife here is, uh, is a big help for me. I feel like she supports me a lot. Um, just doing the a normal day, having her at home, um, helping with every, every general stuff I have, I have to do at home. Um, and then just, of course, having her as a support for tough days. You go home and you feel like you had a bad ride. It's nice to have someone to talk with about it. It's nice to see that he's working hard to accomplish his goals. Um, at the same time, I sometimes wish that I could take a nap and take that power to him that I get from the nap because he could really need some extra sleep. But I think he's so determined to just do this the best he can. So seeing him doing that, it's just makes me happy. As the students get closer to the end of the T-38 phase, the natural inclination to look ahead creeps in. Possibly going to a new aircraft, I mean, there's always unknowns, which is exciting. Um, I'm definitely excited to get out of uh, the training environment, even though the follow-on assignment will be more training, but definitely get back in the CAF. I'm definitely looking forward to that, getting back to uh, the squadron and getting to travel the world and just doing the mission that uh, you, know, you, you want to do instead of getting instructors barking at you all day. So it's always in the back of your head. Your assignment night's really big and it can, can you know, control your career for the rest of your life or at least a little doorway into other careers for you or other aircraft you could fly. But I still think the, the main goal here is to get the wings on your chest. I mean, no matter what airframe that you get, getting those wings on your chest is what we came here for. And it's hard to say where after 10 years when our, our kind of our commitment's over and we start looking to go on to other things like it's hard to really say where I'm going to be at because there's a part of me that would love to go out and be a weapons school guy or maybe try to go to TPS or try to be a squadron commander or maybe you realize, hey, I, I love flying and all I want to do is stay in the cockpit. Um, so I guess all those options have an appeal to me and it's, it's probably going to take a little bit of time actually in a, in a real you know, active duty, active duty aircraft to figure out what, where your heart really lies.
uh, Simon Knight has a theme. And we came down to either the not Academy Award night, because there's no Academy uh, students in our class, or the Summer X Games. And we all voted on that. The majority of the class decided the Summer X Games is what we wanted. It wasn't until after we decided that that there seemed to be a little bit of confusion from the Italians. And I think it's because they didn't have any idea what the X Games was and what they were going to dress up as. Although the students put in a dream sheet ranking their career airframe preferences, that is just but one step in the process of aircraft assignment. The process begins uh, about three weeks before drop night uh, when we have to give a list of our students uh, to Air Education and Training Command. Once we have the order of merit, we start with the top person for order of merit and we give them the top choice of the available aircraft for us. We go down the list until the last person has assigned their aircraft. Once students have been assigned an aircraft, their mindsets quickly start taking shape. It's kind of an exciting time. There's a lot of anxiety and tension and excitement leading up to assignment night. And then there's certainly some uh, relief for some and uh, excitement for some as well as they uh, now have an idea of what they're going to do the rest of their career. In almost every class, a student is selected for first assignment instructor pilot duty. In class 1407, Second Lieutenant Jordan Ziegler gets the call to join the FAPE Mafia. Uh, I think Ziegler will be a great FAPE, so we're uh, really excited to bring him on board as one of ours and uh, kind of show him the ropes of being an instructor. So I think he's got the attitude and maturity and the uh, ability to be a great uh, first assignment instructor pilot here at NGIP. Uh, I'll have to go to Pitt and Pitt, I believe, is about six months long. 
and then I'll jump right into flight and start instructing for three years. Definitely a night that I'll never forget. Wow, nice discount. Just for a split second there, it was just pure bliss. I feel like I was on cloud nine. It's a it's a great, great feeling. I think he's always had this goal in his mind since he was just a little boy. He's always had this uh, want to progress and to do good in anything that he tried to do, and he was very good at it. And to fully appreciate it, understand what guys and girls go through to get their wings on their chest, uh, you can't unless you do it yourself. It was fantastic. I'm so proud. And it was neat because it came following his dad. So it was, it was just special, very special. Oh, we're very proud because Greg has now become the third generation of Fermac uh, Air Force pilots. My father was an Air Force pilot, I was, and now my son is. So we're very proud of him. Now that class 1407 has graduated from flight school, the training continues with IFF, or Introduction to Fighter Fundamentals. You, you walk around, you're a little more confident. You have graduated uh, UPT, you have your wings on your chest. So you're a little bit more excited and anxious to go ahead and get started on IFF. IFF basically is uh, the follow-on from the UPT. What they've learned in UPT is kind of basic aircraft control, instrument flying, basic flying, flying a fast jet. What comes down to IFF is the introduction to fighter fundamentals. So now they're going to use this airplane kind of as a weapon. So air to air engagement, air to air fights, and air to ground engagements as bombing uh, targets. So that's the big difference between basic flying and now using it as a weapon. Historically, IFF was set up in the 70s because there was a a big washout rate 
uh, in the formal training units for F4s and follow-on fighters. So the Air Force said we need some sort of lead-in training so that the expense can be saved of doing all the initial sorties in those F4s and learning to do complicated tactical maneuvering like uh, dog fighting and surface attack. Um, and they needed it in something cheaper, so they moved it towards a trainer aircraft. Um, and they called that lead in for fighter training, it's called Lift. And it's evolved into IFF, what it is today, which is essentially teaching those basic uh, fighting maneuvers, surface attack, uh, in a trainer aircraft that they're familiar with. So now we can just evolve the training to the more complicated tactical maneuvering. The training never stops at NJEP for these newly pinned pilots as they move on to their selected airplanes and their future flying assignments in the Air Force. They expect from us to be good pilots already and they focus on uh, weapon employment, on being a good wingman, etc. So you got to know the, the basics and they will teach you the specifics about the fire pilots. The training never stops. This is just one more uh, roadblock prior to getting into my F-15. From here, I immediately PCS out to Klamath Falls, Oregon to go fly the F-15. And from there, I have my seven-month to eight-month B course. And then from there, once uh, you're technically initially qualified in the F-15, then I'll go to my first duty station, which at that point, I'm still not mission qualified. And from that day, I'll continue to train at my first duty station until I am considered mission qualified. And then there's different progressions that you make throughout your career. So the training never stops, not for a fighter pilot. What's in store for these young pilots? We'll just have to wait and see. Good luck in Jeff Class 1407, and congratulations.